in eastern Germany, um, they made a, a sprawling um, tunnel system that sprawls over tens of miles called the Regenwurmlager. And this was used by the SS and the Wehrmacht and other uh, German military and, and paramilitary organizations in the 30s and 40s. And also in, in, in Germany proper and, and in the occupied territories, whether east or west, the tote organization also carried out a lot of important engineering works. Well, Fritz Tote was killed during the course of the war in a plane crash in 1942. And at that point, uh, one of his um, engineers named uh, Xaver Dorsch, X-A-V-E-R is his first name, Dorsch, D-O-R-S-C-H, took over for him. And at first, um, Dorsch answered to Albert Speer, but then in approximately the last 18 months of the war, Adolf Hitler wanted uh, Xaver Dorsch to report to him, so at that point, Xaver Dorsch reported directly to Adolf Hitler. And after the war, Dorsch was taken into, um, uh, was captured by the Americans and was taken into um, military captivity and was under the control of, of the American army and in, in 46 and 47. I have a couple of the documents that he wrote while he was debriefed uh, by the American military by the American military while he was in captivity and prison of war camps there. I don't know what happened to him between 1947 and 1952. For five years, uh, he drops off the radar of, radar of my research. He did surface again in 1952 publicly in Germany when he founded a civil engineering company, which still exists today, and it's a well-respected uh, German engineering company. Um, there's nothing secret about, about the company. But that period of time between 47 and 52, I haven't yet documented his whereabouts. I don't know where he was. It doesn't mean that he was in hiding, but I think it's entirely possible that during that period of time he was working for the Americans on secret projects, and I say that because two of the declassified documents that I have are are um, memos from Project Paperclip. And of course, Project Paperclip is well known, and it's known that that hundreds, maybe even thousands, of Nazi technicians, engineers, and scientists came to the United States under Project Paperclip. Now, this particular memo that I have asks for Xaver Dorsch. It asks for a couple of, three dozen of other uh, Nazi engineers, scientists, and technicians, but it, it also asks for him by name and three other engineers to come to the United States to work for the American military on their underground plant program. So I, I therefore consider it possible, maybe even very likely, that he was brought to the United States to do that because he certainly was in American, um, under American military control at that time. I find that fascinating, Joe. Oh, yeah, I do, too. I, you know, some of this stuff just, just <laughs> makes me insane. Well, he, in other words, he was Adolf Hitler's number one man for underground uh, construction, and they built some, some really impressive uh, and elaborate uh, facilities, well-made, um, at that time in you know, 42, 43, even up into 44 in the very closing stages of the war. And then when the American military and the, um, the, the Soviet military, military came into Germany proper in large numbers, that, then there was no question. The game was up, and all of the construction stopped at that point. But, of course, the Americans and also the Soviets would have gone into those facilities and seen what they had and snapped up as many of those people as they could at that point. The Americans happened to get Xaver Dorsch, who was prob probably at that point the number one engineer in the world in terms of underground construction. So he was, he was under their uh, control, and I got two of the briefing documents that he wrote for him. I expect that there were other, others that are still classified to this point. I have spoken to a pretty high-ranking engineer who was in some of that Nazi stuff, and his opinion now, in, in, in the first part of the 21st century, even, the, even now his opinion is that it was uh, the facilities were well made. 
Yeah. So, in other words, that was brought over here, and we do know now from this, uh, from these declassified project paperclip uh, uh, memoranda that I have, um, out of NASA's project paperclip archive, by the way, that they were they were asking for this guy and other Nazi engineers to come uh, to work on the American military's underground plant program, whatever that is. But it was all already underway in the 1940s in the immediate post-World War II era. And, you know, I was thinking about that because th th these projects were already running. And, and what bothers me about all of this is how ignorant the people are themselves. I, I mean, first off, we're talking, what was World War II, 60 years now, That's right? 60 years ago, and it was already underway then. Right. So we have an accumulating, accumulated 60-year period of near total ignorance on the part of the American public. Yeah, and of what's being done with their money, with their military personnel, their their federal agencies under under our feet, and we don't know about it. Yeah, and we don't have a clue about it. Well, we do have a clue, thanks to shows like this, and thanks to my books and articles and interviews. But we still don't know about ninety nine percent of it. Yeah, and, and we don't, and, and we don't even know where. You know, I've I've been from, since the very first time I've talked to you back in the wake of USA days. I've been accumulating, you know, talking to people, talking to insiders, talking to anybody I can find, where they may actually be underground facilities in the United States. We may, may, and I use this word may in a big way here, we may know where there's 50 or 60 facilities, not including the ones that FEMA listed. Yeah. But the FEMA facilities, I think, are a little different. I think they're shallow facilities, probably less than a couple of stories underground. Well, let me tell you about FEMA. Number one, there are a lot of FEMA facilities. I document some of them in my book. Yeah, a bunch of them. Yes, and they're sprinkled around the country. Many of them are comparatively shallow, going down maybe 100 feet or less and, and only having two or three stories underground. And, and, and some of those are known, and I document them. In, in my writings, including in my first book. However, having said that, FEMA does have some more elaborate and deeper and larger facilities. Perhaps the best known is Mount Weather, which lies about an hour's drive west of Washington, D.C., in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, and that's quite large and deep and elaborate. That facility was built in the mid-20th century, back in the 1950s. It, well, which, exists, which it exists to this day, and it's been enlarged. It's very large. Which one was the one they closed, the one at the hotel? I can't never remember the name of it. Well, that was at the um, the Greenbrier Hotel yeah, yeah. at White Sulphur Springs down in, in West Virginia. Um, now, at one time, that was intended as a shelter for the United States Congress. And the Greenbrier Hotel, for many years, was a resort where the high and mighty and the well-heeled went. Um, they had some hot springs there and so forth. Um, it's, it's, it's not... The, the kind of place where the where the upper crust hang out these days, not like they did 50 or 100 years ago. But um, yeah, that place became known uh, about 15 or 20 years ago, and they closed it down. It, it in its day in the 1950s was kind of cutting edge, but no more. They have much better, much more secure, much more elaborate, much deeper facilities now, and well, that are much more not only much more secure, but much more secret. The, the reason I brought it up is uh, Jennifer from Seattle, Washington, had wrote in and asked that she had heard it had been closed, but she, she, she said, well, did they just close it down and not replace it? Does Congress think there's not a threat for a nuclear war anymore? No, th there are other facilities that are more secret, and I'm sure there's a place for the Congress. Um, do we want the Congress to be sheltered, Joe? Yeah, whatever. Let me tell you, this goes back to this 9% approval rate and them getting raises. No, I don't think they need a raise, and I think they need to go along with the rest of us when all hell breaks. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but I really do feel that way. Frankly speaking, the United States Congress is is thoroughly corrupt, and I mean oh criminally God, corrupt. Is it? is it? The average congressman is, is just uh, like, a, like a, a crime lord almost. Um, it's, it's, it's way out of control. The Congress is not at all doing the public's work at this point. They are bought and sold, and I just described 95% of the American Congress. The, but I, I don't have any doubt that there is more a more elaborate, deeper, more sophisticated facility.